Hi everybody, Tommy T here. Thank you so much for watching my series on AB300. As I go through this program, it's important that you understand everything that I'm explaining to you and all the information as we go through. If you have any questions during the presentation, please email me. My email is info at safebodyarttraining.com. The most important person in the classroom is always the student. That's you. So please reach out to me and email me. I'll be glad to help you out. By the time you are done with this series, you will be an expert on following regulations in the body piercing industry. So what do you say, folks? Let's do it. In this series, I will explain each section and subsection in the Safe Body Art Act. I will go through the sections in detail. I'll explain how to read the section, how to record your act of compliance, and how to fill out the paperwork. This series covers Assembly Bill 1168 of the California Health and Safety Code, approved October 4th, 2013, otherwise known as the Safe Body Art Act. This series is for body piercing only. I will not go over tattooing, branding, permanent cosmetics, or ear piercing. Some of the sections in this legislation are too long to cover comprehensively in this video. So a series of sub-videos have been created to complete the training for the Safe Body Art Act in its entirety. These are the materials you will need to complete this course. After you get these materials together, I'd like you to go to the website under capital E on the next slide and print out a copy of the Safe Body Art Act, AB 1168, from the State of California website. So stop the video. My email address is down here on the slide. It's info at safebodyarttraining.com. Ask for a set of handouts for the Safe Body Art Training video. Okay, everybody, I'd like you to get a copy of Assembly Bill 1168 from the California Legislation Information section of ca.gov website. What I'd like you to do is go to your address bar and type in California Legislation Information and make sure that the address that you pick is the one shown on this slide. And then once you do that, the first step is to select bill information. The second step is to type in AB 1168 under bill number. And then you're going to select the year, which is 2013. That's the third step. And then hit search and a list of bills will come up. The first bill on the list should be AB 1168. You'll see body art, safe body art in there. Go ahead and print that out. And we're going to record your acts of compliance, where they're at in your shop, or where they're at in your infection prevention control plan, or where they're at in your exposure control plan. And you're gonna basically have a completely filled in copy of the regulation that shows everywhere that you've complied, how you've complied, so on and so forth. Okay, all right, let's go. By the end of this series, you will be able to know and understand each section and subsection in the Safe Body Art Act. You will be able to verify that you and your shop are compliant with each section, and you'll be able to investigate your shop, your equipment, and your administrative controls and you'll be prepared for a health department inspection with supporting documentation. Okay, so we're getting going here. You've printed out the regulation and you have your handouts. We are going to underline words, phrases, or paragraphs as we go through the regulation. Please read the regulation starting from the beginning on the first page. Don't skip anything. I'll ask you to skip sections down the road, but that's because we have another video for that section. When I ask you to stop and underline something, please do that. Please read the instructions on the slide, pause the video, and do the work. Go to section 119300, lowercase b, and underline the entire paragraph shown on your screen. We'll discuss the underlined items as we go along. So now we're at the definitions section of the Safe Body Art Act. Definitions are important. Read them, go through the the definition page, or there should be two pages. 
Look up the content of the definition. If you don't understand something, look up the definition of the words in the content of the definition. I want to show you why definitions are important. You should actually study your definitions for a couple days before you continue on with this video. It's a really good idea to get used to them. Let me show you here. Let's go to section 119301N. I'm going to leave it up to you to study the definitions. I'm not going to go through every def definition with you. If I do, all I'm going to do is teach you how to read the definition and then how to look up the definition of words within the definition. And let me show you why that's important. Section 119301, lowercase n, we have instrument. It says, non-medical application device. This means you may not use your instrument to perform medical procedures. It's not a medical device. An example of that is don't cut out a dermal. If you have blade, razor blades back there or you have needles back there, those are not medical devices. So you, you cannot do a medical procedure with them. A scalpel is what's used by a licensed healthcare professional to cut something out of your skin. If you have somebody with a dermal that needs to be cut out, you need to send them to a doctor and have a doctor do it. Plain and simple. You're not a licensed healthcare professional. Hopefully, you've studied the definitions. Don't worry, we'll go over them many times during all of my videos. For this slide, we're going to need to get a copy of the original version of AB 300, the Safe Body Art Act. To do that, we need to go back to the California Legislation Information website. So go ahead and do that. Open up a browser. Type in California Legislation Information. When you get to the website, select Bill Information. Then under Year, select 2011-2012. And in the Bill Number box, type in 300. Then hit search, it'll come up, Safe Body Art Act, print it out. Once you've printed it out, you don't need to read this one from start to finish because we're doing that in uh, 1168. But there are sections that were not amended in 1168 and this is one of them. So I want you to go to section 119302B and we are going to go down to lowercase b, read that entire section, 119302. When you get to b, underline performed in the presence of his or her guardian. The reason this is important is because presence is in attendance here or nearby. They have to actually stay throughout the entire procedure. And if you go down farther, under lowercase d, underline the piercing of nipples or genitals of a minor is pr prohibited. I've had people get a little confused on this. It doesn't matter if the minor is a male or a female. It says the piercing of nipples on a minor is prohibited. So even if it's a male, nipples are prohibited. So now we are going to start writing our references on the SBAA and the informed consent form and an aftercare form. These are going to be kept as our records with the SBAA when we're done. This is how it works. On the SBAA, next to the section number, write your act of compliance as shown in this table. On the informed consent form, write the section number down that relates to that paragraph. And on the aftercare form, write the SBAA section number down that relates to each section on the form. Just follow the tables that I've left you for examples and it'll be real easy for you. You're basically going to have a reference on the regulation on each section number all the way through to the end of the regulation. Okay, we are now at section 119303 lowercase a, the prior to the performance of the body art section. From now on, you may see cursive writing on some of the slides, as you see here. That is where you are writing your active compliance note 
next to the section on your shop copy of the Safe Body Art Act. This is a reference to where or how you complied in your shop with that section code. You will also write a section code reference on your copies of the informed consent form and aftercare form when we get to sections that relate to those forms. And we are going to write section numbers on your informed consent form and release form. So basically, in the SBAA, you're going to write what your act of compliance is next to the section number. On your informed consent form and on your aftercare form, you're going to write what section number each paragraph relates to. Real simple. By doing this, you'll have an accurate record of all your compliance. And you'll have a quick reference to where your acts of compliance are in your shop. Okay, so if you look down here under 119303 lowercase a1, you have description of the procedure. Now, our description of the procedure is framed up by the register that people read. And it describes what they're going to go through while they're getting pierced from beginning to end. We have them read that and we have them sign on the release form that they've read that. So that's our act of compliance. So we have down here release form and aftercare form. 119303A2, a description of what the client should expect following the procedure, including suggested care and any medical complications that may occur as a result of the procedure. That's on the aftercare form. You sign that you read it on the aftercare form, and we give you the aftercare form, and we go over aftercare at the register, but then we give you the aftercare form for you to sit down and read it, and we also have you sign that you've read it. And three, at the very bottom, a state, statement regarding the permanent nature of body art, and that's actually on the release form or the informed consent form. Okay, so here's your actual acts of compliance. And this is before, this is your shop copy that you're going you're gonna to keep with your copy of the SBAA that you're writing your reference notes on. Now we are at post-procedure instructions. This is section 119303 lowercase a 5 in AB 1168 and post procedure instructions that include all of the following. Uppercase A information on the care of the procedure site. That's going to be in your aftercare forms. And B is going to be restrictions on physical activity such as bathing, recreational water activity, gardening. That too is going to be in your aftercare form. I believe it's on the last page of the ones that we gave you in the handouts. Now on the aftercare form where you find the paragraph that talks about that, you're going to want to put the section reference that that paragraph covers. If you're looking at B here, for example, restrictions on physical activities, contact with animals, so on and so forth, in the aftercare form, you're going to want to write down section 119303, you don't have to write section, but 119303, lowercase a, 5, capital B. And that will refer to this right here. So you're writing your reference on the shop copy of the SBAA. And then you're writing your section code on your aftercare form that you're going to keep with your shop copy that references back to the SBAA. Okay? Hope that's not too confusing. If you get confused at any time, please get a hold of me. My email is always open. Email me and I'll be happy to help you out.
Let's do a quick review on the content on the previous page. In 119303A5C, it is common for a client to mistake degranulation and healthy inflammation for an infection. Clients also mistake plasma discharge for infection too. Explaining these differences ahead of time will help keep your client focused on their proper aftercare. Although discharge is normal and healthy, without a gentle technique of wound irrigation provided by sea salt soaks, foreign materials, cellular debris, and bacterial contamination can promote infection. A well-fashioned explanation of the differences will help your client stay focused on their proper aftercare. It is best to explain how sea salt soaks work, how it removes necrotic tissue that overwhelm the healing process, how it reduces the bacteria count on the wound, and how it helps to promote healthy skin cell growth. So we haven't done a whole lot of work on the shop yet, but you've learned how to navigate the Safe Body Art Act. You know there's two versions of it, the original bill AB300 and the amended bill of AB1168. You understand how to underline items as we go along, and you know how to write your act of compliance in the bill. You also know how to write your section reference on a copy of the shop forms, the informed consent form, and the aftercare form. These forms will be added as an addendum to your regulations, and you'll file them together. All right, let's get back to work. The Safe Body Art Act gets a little confusing here because it jumps back and forth between what to do before the procedure, what to do after the procedure, and again, what to do before the procedure. I'll make it easy for you. Go to 119303 lowercase b in AB 1168 and draw a line above that subsection code horizontally across the page. Now go down to below 4 and draw a line horizontally across the paper. In that boxed off area, write on release form under questions. These are your customer's health history questions. Okay, we are getting good at writing our active compliance references on the Safe Body Art Act. Here you can see how I boxed in the section and wrote my compliance reference. I've drawn two lines, one above lowercase b and another below 4, and I noted where these items are located for my active compliance. On the release form, I will write next to each question the section number associated with that question. Here I'm writing my active compliance reference on the regulation, the Safe Body Art Act, and I'm also going to write a reference on my shop copy of the release form. I'm going to write section number down on that too to reference back. Now we're going to go to release form questions. These questions are the health history of your client. They are protected under the HIPAA Act. Section 119303, lowercase c, states that these records must be maintained or disposed of in compliance of those provisions. It's important for the practitioner to understand how to evaluate them. So for the purpose of keeping this video within a reasonable time frame, I will go over questions 6 and 15 in detail and briefly go over the rest of the questions. For a comprehensive explanation of all of these questions, please watch my video, Body Piercing Release Form Questions and Answers by Tommy T. All right, so question number one, have you eaten within the last four hours? I would be looking for underlying issues such as, is the person a diabetic? and I'd be watching for a drop in their blood sugar. That's primarily why I would ask that question. You can also ask it if people are a little bit nervous and if they've been eating. I've had a couple people throw up on me over the years, so that's all. It's always good to know if they have food in their stomach. Have you had any alcoholic beverages in the last eight hours? I mean, generally, you don't want a client drinking before a procedure. It thins the blood and the client can bleed more. It's kind of one of those situations where usually people don't tell you the truth, so you have to use your judgment, and that's what I do. 
Question number three, are you prone to fainting? Investigate why they're prone to fainting. Um, are they, do they have, do they have seizure issues? Do they have anxiety? Do they have blood issues? And then I'd make my decision from there. To become an expert in one's field, one must not just know the content of their discipline, but the context behind it. As you've noticed, I'm not just teaching you the laws, but the meaning behind the law and what information you'll need to accurately confer with your customers. Are you prone to heavy bleeding? Once again, look at the health history. Ask them if they're on a blood thinner. Ask them if they're diabetic. Ask them if they have hemophilia. You want to know why and you want to document that. Question number five, do you have hemophilia? We cannot pierce a client with hemophilia. Question number six, do you, have, do you have to take antibiotics before seeing the dentist? This question will be covered comprehensively on the next slide. Question number seven, have you taken aspirin, ibuprofen, or blood thinners within the last 24 hours? It is generally required for people who want in minor invasive procedures to be off blood thinners for usually a week. For that reason, we will not pierce people that are on blood thinners. If the client has taken aspirin or ibuprofen, we look for the following. Are they under 40 and healthy? Over 40 and recommended by a doctor, we would ask for a medical release. Under 40 and healthy, we might pierce them, but we'll ask other questions. I always refer to getting a doctor's release on stuff like this. As far as blood thinners go, usually if a doctor is, if, usually if somebody is under the care of a doctor, the doctor will not give them a release if there's any reason that, you know, the doctor will not give them a release if there's any danger. As far as ibuprofen and aspirin goes, the rule is that they have to be off ibuprofen or aspirin four to five times the half-life of the medication. A latex allergy. Nowadays, nitrile gloves are cheap, so everybody pretty much uses nitrile gloves nowadays. We don't take any chances, so we don't have any, any latex gloves at all. Latex allergy is no joke, and uh, and you got to really watch out for it. Number nine, do you have antibiotic allergies or any other allergies? If yes, what? Again, this is a medical history question. If a client has metal sensitivity to nickel, one might pierce them with titanium only. A lot of shops only use medical grade titanium. If a client is allergic to penicillin, one would document that on the consent form. Number 10, are you pregnant? We do not do piercings on pregnant women. We may remove a piece of jewelry if everything looks good, but that's a judgment decision. Number 11, do you have jaundice? We would ask if it was liver related. We would investigate if there was an alcohol issue. Alcoholics just do not heal the same way. They do not heal regularly. They have a lot of pathological issues with their with their skin cells and healing. Alcoholics tend to have hypoxia in their skin. They don't have good circulation. Uh, there must be underlying issues with the jaundice. There must be underlying issues. People with jaundice may have clotting issues. For these reasons, we would require a medical release. Number 12, do you have hepatitis? Some dentists have contracted hepatitis. I've never heard of a dentist contracting HIV. Hepatitis can affect bleeding. I would ask them if they know their viral count. If they hardly show signs of disease, if everything looks okay, we use universal precautions, so I would work on them normally. Question number 13, have you recovered from jaundice or hepatitis in the last six months? 
I would get a medical release before uh, piercing that client. Number 14, do you have herpes? Many dentists work on people that have herpes all the time. As long as there isn't a breakout, use universal precautions and work on them normally. Herpes sores are very painful. People who have herpes around their oral area still have to get dental work done. The herpes virus can stay alive outside of the body and be transmitted, so you, you have to be very careful with your PPE to make sure that you're not cross-contaminating, spreading that virus around on your clothing or anything like that. Number 15, do you have diabetes? Diabetes is one of the ones I'm going to go over in detail, so we'll handle that in a couple of slides. Number 16, do you have cardiac valve disease? This question relates to question number six. Usually people who have congenital heart disease need to take antibiotic prophylaxis prior to minor medical procedures. We do not pierce these clients. Number 17, do you have any other conditions that might affect the healing of this piercing? Gather this data for your client's health history, and if you have any questions, consult a physician. Okay, everybody, we're on the ICF health history question number six. Do you have to take antibiotics before seeing the dentist or surgeon? The requirements for antibiotic prophylaxis has changed somewhat over the years. It's actually, it's changed dramatically due to antibiotic overuse. Bacteria and viruses are becoming more and more resistant to antibiotics. MRSA is an example of a strain of staph that is highly resistant to antibiotics. In the 1920s and the 1930s, doctors noticed an increase in infections in heart patients after minor routine invasive surgery. In patients that have congenital heart disease are susceptible to infective endocarditis, which is infection of the heart valves. Doctors noticed more cases of infections after routine dental procedures. Those patients were becoming infected and they were becoming infected through their skin. Staph and strep were entering their system through their skin after these minor procedures. As a result, in the 1950s, the American Heart Association put out guidelines for doctors to recommend an antibiotic prophylaxis prior to dental work or surgery. That all started to change, and in the early 2000s, the AHA only recommended it in severe cases. And nowadays, the AHA recommends a heart healthy diet rather than antibiotic prophylaxis. What they're trying to do is they're trying to stop bacteria and viruses from becoming more resistant to antibiotics. So that's the history on this. That's where this question comes from. I'll explain more on the next slide. Okay, everybody. So once again, we want to emphasize good oral health because people can get infections in other parts of their body if they have a large amount of strep inside their throat. Okay, so as we're going along, I know you're writing your acts of compliance in your SBAA and in your ICF questions, you're writing your section numbers and or notes next to each question. Now we move on to question number 15. Do you have diabetes? Diabetes severely disrupts the healing process. Uncontrolled diabetes leads to pathological cell function during all four phases of the wound healing process. One must really dig into the condition of a diabetic before proceeding with service. Ask the client when he or she checked their sugar level last. Ask them what their blood glucose level was. It's important to know if they are a compliant diabetic or not and what condition they are in. If they are a type 2 diabetic and are under 40, 
and healthy, there are probably as many reasons you can't pierce them if everything looks okay. If they are over 40, won't tell you their sugar level, or don't know it, I would be very wary of piercing them. Diabetes wreaks havoc on one's body. It can generate hypoxia leading to severe ischemia. It disrupts the normal healing function of cells by overproducing sugars which feed pathological cells and starve healthy cells. Cells that receive too much glucose overgrow. For example, tumors need 10 times the sugar level as compared to a normal cell. Scarring, slow healing time, and ulcers can form around wounds where normal glucose hemostasis is not present. Do a thorough consultation with the diabetic prior to the procedure. If you don't feel like you're getting the answers that you need, or you don't feel comfortable, ask them for a doctor's release. So you can see from this chart that diabetes impairs every phase of wound healing. Hypoxia and hyperglycemia increase production of reactive oxygen species and advanced glycation end products, which in abundance are associated with pathological cell growth. Fibroblasts, which are the connective tissue in cells, show impairment. In diabetics, keratinocytes behave dysfunctionally. Decreased MMP cell proliferation, as well as abnormal angiogenesis, results in wounds not healing timely, homeostatically, or at all. Wound healing occurs in four specific phases. Hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling. On a healthy person with a subcutaneous wound, vascular restriction starts immediately, while platelet infiltration and fibrin formation initiate creating a thrombus. This stage somewhat seals the wound. In the next stage of proliferation, angiogenesis occurs with splitting and sprouting of cells, creating macrophages that destroy microparticles and microbes, the body's first defense against infection. Degranulation tissue forms approximately four days after the lesion. In body piercing, a main factor contributing to pathological wound healing is pressure. Pressure can come from unbalanced, improperly angled, or inaccurate jewelry placement. Pathological cell formation from pressure is either intentional or unintentional. Pressure applied to piercing wounds during sleep account for a great deal of improperly healed wounds. Wounds that are continually exposed to inhibiting factors can develop ulcers, commonly referred to as keloids. Pressure applied to piercing wounds during sleep account for a great deal of improperly healed wounds. While most unwanted cells disappear during the remodeling phase of wound healing, wounds that are continually exposed to inhibiting factors can develop ulcers commonly referred to as keloids in the piercing industry. Protecting wounds from pressure, usually with a surgical gauze, helps the wound heal better. Always consult with your clients and inform them of these issues.